In 1900, Toronto was a quiet town of only 200,000, but only five years later it had grown by 50% to 300,000. The city was bustling. The main form of entertainment was live theatre, but most of the theatres were makeshift relics from the last century when Toronto was still a backwater. The city needed a new theatre that reflected its new status. In 1906, Kothra Mulock, known as the Boy Millionaire, set about correcting this. He hired architect John Lyle and instructed him, Build me the finest theatre on the continent. The Royal Alexandra Theatre, the first North American theatre to be issued a royal patent by Buckingham Palace, officially opened on August 26, 1907. Immediately, the Royal Alex became the place to be. Its roster of stars is an honor roll of 20th century theater. Mary Pickford, Helen Hayes, Al Jolson, Orson Welles, Humphrey Bogart, John and Ethel Barrymore, Fred and Adele Astaire, Catherine Cornell, Deborah Kerr, John Gielgud, Ralph Richardson, Edith Piaf sang here, Paul Robeson played Othello here, Pavlova danced here, the Marx Brothers made Alex audiences laugh, and Mae West made them blush. By the late 1950s, it was the city's only surviving legitimate theater that had not been converted into a cinema. But its fortunes began to wane. First film and then television offered other forms of entertainment. The Royal Alex had to find new energy, and perhaps a new owner to flourish again. That owner was Ed Mervish, who, with the enthusiastic support of his wife Anne, bought the theater in 1963, saved it from demolition, spent lavishly to restore it, and built an exciting neighborhood around it. Today, the Royal Alex is as vital as ever, and still considered the finest theater on the continent. Let's now discover the building itself. The exterior of the building is brick and sandstone. Beneath its exterior walls are two feet of concrete, reinforced by a steel structure, the first theater in North America to be constructed this way. Stepping into the front foyer, it's easy to see the splendor of the materials used. The foyer is clad in a green marble imported from Italy. The floor is a mosaic created by craftsmen in Venice. Step through the second set of doors and you're in a sea of rich walnut wood imported from Turkey. The grand staircases were hand-carved of cherry wood from Austria and Hungary. Above the doors leading into the auditorium is the crest of the British royal family, as the Alex has a royal patent and is named after Alexandra, the consort of Edward VII, later Queen Alexandra, and the great-grandmother of Queen Elizabeth II. Off the front lobby are rooms where the audience can rest and perhaps enjoy a beverage before the performance and at intermission. The manager's office is also here, a wood-paneled room where the theater's early news clippings are kept. Inside the auditorium, the wainscoting and doorways are of sturdy Canadian oak. The walls are covered in cream and gold silk. The seats are upholstered in striped cream and gold wool and silk gabardine, specially woven in England by Burberries. Until the 1950s, it was customary for men to wear hats. But what to do with them during the performance? The answer was to put them under the seat in these specially designed wire racks. All the decorative carvings in the building were made by artisans brought over from Germany. All the ornate plaster work on the walls and ceilings was made by master craftsmen from France. At the top of the proscenium arch, which frames the stage, is the sounding board. Its purpose is to bounce the sound of the actors' voices from the stage into the auditorium. At the Royal Alex, the sounding board features a mural by Frederick Schaliner, the finest muralist of his time. It shows a classical scene, Venus and attendants discovering the sleeping Adonis with Cupid close by. Now let's go to the dress circle, which is the second level of seating in the auditorium. Thanks to the structure's steel frame, the Royal Alex was the first theater to have cantilevered balconies, meaning the weight of the balconies is held up by the steel and concrete structure, not pillars, which would obstruct the view of audience members seated behind them. When Lady Diana, the Princess of Wales, came to see Les Miserables at the Royal Alex in 1990, this is where she sat. Dress circle, first row, center seat. Off the dress circle is the CAA lounge. Overlooking King Street, this gracious room is beautifully appointed and a favorite with patrons. 
The balcony is the third level of seating. It offers great views, but is much higher up. In the 19th century, the balcony would have been called the gods, for obvious reasons. On the sides of the stage are a few more seats. These are called the boxes. Traditionally, this is where public figures sat so that they could be seen by everyone else in the auditorium. Now let's walk back downstairs to the orchestra level. But first, as we descend the staircase, note all the framed photos on the walls. These are only some of the noteworthy stars from the Royal Alex's first four decades. Before we go on stage and backstage, let's go to the newest part of the building, the Yale Simpson Lounge. Named after a former general manager of the theater, it was built in 1990 in the former crawl space of the theater. We'll go backstage through the green room, which is located just the other side of this door. The green room is where the actors, crew members, and musicians can hang out when they're not on stage. There are many theories about why it's called the green room, but you should know that no green room in any theater is actually green. Behind the back wall of the stage are the dressing rooms. In fact, there are four levels of dressing rooms, which can accommodate more than 40 performers. Here we are in the stage right wings. The set on stage is Come From Away, which has been playing at the Royal Alex since February of 2018, one of the theater's most popular shows. Notice that the view from the stage allows you to see every seat in the auditorium. That means every seat provides a good view of the stage. Now we are in the old stage door room, which is located on the east side of the building. Until the late 1980s, this was the entrance to the stage for everyone who worked here. The room has been left intact because of its rich history, and a new stage door was created at the rear of the building. Notice that there are more actors' photos on the wall, even on the ceiling. If these walls could talk, the stories they could tell of the lives of the show people who've walked through here. We are now on the fly floor. In olden days, this is where technicians would control the scenery hung in the fly tower. They would lower scenery pieces onto the stage to create a new setting while raising or flying out the scenery from the previous scene. Fun fact, the people originally hired to do this job were sailors because they had experience with ropes and sails. The fly tower is almost 100 feet tall. Behind it are the four levels of dressing rooms. What a different world it is back here from the rich and gilded world of the auditorium and lobbies. Thank you for joining us for this tour of the Royal Alex. We hope you've enjoyed a little of this beloved building's history. In closing, here is David Mervish, the theater's owner. He is the son of Ed and Ann Mervish. Like his parents, he loves this building and is committed to continuing its long tradition of offering the best in theater to audiences in Toronto and beyond. The theater isn't just another business. It's a lifelong passion. The Royal Alexandra Theater is the place where my wife and I had our first date. I'm very honored to partner with CAA in making theater more accessible to its members. CAA's dedication to its community and its support of the arts is superb. Thank you for that support. As a member since 1966, they give me the confidence to keep running my car. I look forward to seeing you at the theater when the time is right. Please stay tuned for a big announcement delivering CAA members even more excitement and benefits when they attend our four incredible theaters.